Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, session of CIC. Today we have a distinguished panel. Noshad Forbes is here. He is the co-chairman of Forbes Marshall, India's leading steam engineering and control instrumentation firm. Forbes Marshall's deep process knowledge helps their customers save energy, improve product quality, increase process efficiency, etc., etc. But he has been a lecturer and a consulting professor at Stanford University from 1987 to 2004, where he developed courses on technology in newly industrialized countries. He received his bachelor's, master's and PhD degrees from the Stanford University. He is on the board of several educational institutions and public companies. He is the chairman of Center for Technology, Innovation and Economic Research in Pune. He has had a long uh, career in the industry and he is also an active member of CII and has at various times chaired the National Committee on Higher Education, Innovation, Technology and International Business. He was president of CII for in the year 2016-17. It's a pleasure to welcome you, Mr. Nasha. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. In conversation with him will be Kapil Vishwanathan. Kapil has been instrumental in the conception and establishment of the Kriya University and serves as the chairman of its executive committee. With a mission to prepare humanity for an unpredictable world, Kriya University aims to reimagine research and learning for the world of the future. The university is backed by a strong governing council composed of distinguished leaders from academia and industry. He is also the president of the Institute of Financial Management and Research, IFMR, a 50-year-old not-for-profit society focused on education and research. Previously, Kapil was the co-founder and co-CEO of Lumina Datamatics, erstwhile pre-media global, an edtech company employing over 2,000 people across the US, Europe and India. Headquartered in Boston, the company grew rapidly to become the leading partner for global content companies such as McGraw Hill and Pearson Learning. In 2014, the company merged with the content technology division of Mumbai based Datamatics Global Services. After overseeing the integration of this merger, Kapil and his co founder exited the business. And after exit in 2016, Kapil has dedicated himself to the philanthropic cause of starting Korea University. Earlier in his career, Kapil worked in global sales for Tata Consultancy Services, spanning markets in Australia, Asia, UK and the US, and participated in the corporate think tank. He has served on corporate boards for the past 22 years. He is the managing director of Enfield AgroBase, a social enterprise focused on organic agriculture and rural development. He writes a regular column in Mint titled Learning 4.0, where he serves, shares his thoughts on the future of learning and the future of business and work. He has also co-authored some of the columns with collaborators including Nobel laureate Abhijit Banerjee of MIT, biotech entrepreneur Kiran Shah of Biocon and Stanford University Provost John Ekmendi. Well, the session would also discuss the book that uh, Mr. Noshad has written, The Struggle and the Promise, Restoring India's Potential. This has been highly acclaimed and uh, I'm sure the conversation will throw up many uh, facets, many fascinating facets from the book. Welcome both of you and the floor is yours, Kapil. Thank you, Mr. Chandramauli, for that uh, very long uh, and uh, generous introduction. <laughs> yes. You described it as a, you described it as a, a panel, but I think the spotlight is very much on our friend, uh, Dr. Narshad Forbes. Uh, so here. discussion. And, uh, <laughs> First of all, many congratulations, Noshad, on this book. Uh, it, it, was, it, was a very, uh, it was a very pleasurable read and there were such tremendous insights. I couldn't, it was a page turner. I actually really enjoyed reading it and uh, many insights that uh, uh, provoke a lot of thoughts uh, in many of us. So many, many congratulations and thank you for being here. Great um, to be here. Thanks. So I thought what we do today is uh, maybe uh, take... Uh, uh, take, taking off from Noshad's book, uh, look at things, uh, India's struggle and uh, promise from an economy standpoint, from a political standpoint, 
from an education and research standpoint uh, and from a cultural uh, standpoint. And uh, as we sort of phase the discussion from one to the other, um, I thought it may be nice to open up the floor to questions at each stage so that when we're discussing the economy, I can ask a couple of questions and then open out uh, to the floor. Um, but before we get started with this format, I had a quick question. Does, has anyone here heard of uh, Eswatini? What is it? Eswatini. Pradeep is thinking it's the latest cocktail at Radio Room, but it's not. I was actually thinking I'll Google it up. So in preparing for our discussion uh, today, I learned that uh, 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 Swaziland in uh, the southern, southern Africa has been renamed Eswatini. Uh, and the relevance <clears throat> of that for today's talk is that Eswatini is among 150 countries whose GDP per capita exceeds that of India's, whether you look at it in BPP terms or in nominal <coughs> terms, it's 120, 150 countries ahead oh. of uh, India. Uh, that said, Nosha, tell us why you wrote an entire chapter about why you think India can lead the world, uh, given where we are. So, you know, first of all, it's, 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 wonderful. it's wonderful to be here. Um, and uh, uh, I, should, I should start by saying that there's a family connection with Chennai or Madras as it was. My father grew up here. He, he moved here when he was six months old and lived in... Uh, in Madras as it then was, uh, until he was, I think, 18 and went to college. Um, and he has, throughout his life, always talked to us about Madras because he, uh, uh, I think his, many of his happiest years were spent here. And it was obviously a very different city then. Um, but uh, there are many elements that I think continue uh, even, uh, even today in terms of the, the life of the city and what, it's, what makes it so, so different and special. Um, so I'm, one, I'm really happy to be here. So why did I, well, let me, let me first start by saying why I wrote the book and then why I wrote a chapter, particularly on economic growth and our ability to catch up. Um, you know, when I, when I, my course used to really look at technology in developing countries and um, I made, I wasn't the, obviously the only one, um, the, the building of technical capability was an integral part of economic growth and especially an integral part of economic growth in the long run, right? So uh, how do you build technical capability? How do you build it over a long period of time? And how do you use that technical capability as a way to keep growing at the economic level and in individual firms, how do you keep growing rapidly for decades? So that's sort of what the course covered. Um, and as I taught the course, I would look at different countries. So I would always have the Indian experience in my head, but I would look at Brazil, I would look at Mexico, and I used to look at particularly South Korea and Taiwan. And these were sort of the four countries that were I had always compare what we were doing as a country with when I first started teaching the course. At that point in time, China was not on the, on the stage, actually, as an industrial country. It was just starting in the 90s to emerge as a rapidly growing country, but a rapidly growing country based largely on agricultural development uh, in the you know, certainly through the 80s, um, as the Deng Xiaoping era sort of rolled out, the reform era rolled out, uh, it was largely agricultural reform that drove the Chinese economy forward in the first 10 years of its opening up. And then things started to change in the 90s. And certainly by the last time I taught the course, China was a, a new entrant uh, into the course as a place to learn from in terms of how they systematically build technical capability. So all of that is a long way of saying that technical capability is the heart of growing rapidly for all countries, developed and developing in the long run, that developing countries have a huge opportunity to catch up with the richer world by growing more rapidly than they do over not just a few years, but over decades. And that for us in India, um, we lost many decades up to 1991, where as a country, we grew slower, broadly speaking, than the rest of the world. So we fell back in overall and our overall ranking. Many other countries certainly did a lot better than us. I mean, South Korea and India had the same per capita GDP in 1960. 
Today, South Korea, as you know, uh, after 30 years of the most rapid growth in our, in our history, uh, after that, South Korea today has a per capita GDP that is over 15 times our GDP. If you look at China, China and India had the same per capita GDP in 1980. Um, today, China has a per capita GDP more than five times um, ours. Um, and this came from rapid growth, same thing, over decades. And it came from this building of technical capability uh, on an ongoing basis that enabled countries to catch up with the richer world. So it's eminently possible, but it's possible if you're ready, if you have the right social capital. And if you do the right kinds of things, and the right kinds of things includes foreign trade, so there's a whole chapter on that, um, and, be, and you're open to the world. Um, it involves building, uh, really, in the case of all of the countries that I talked about, um, certainly South Korea, Taiwan in the 60s and 70s, and then China from 1990 onwards, building a strong export-oriented industry. Um, and especially an export-oriented industry that builds on the human capital that the country has in abundance. Um, and it involves actually an, uh, uh, the state playing a very role in, uh, in the development experience of these countries. In South Korea, in Taiwan, it played a very important role. In China, it continues to play a leading role. And I would argue that in India, uh, we saw the economy really take off in 1991 when the state stepped back from the role that it had earlier been playing and actually played a more focused and limited role, um, but definitely a much more limited role than, um, than, than, than what we had seen in the, in the decades before. So the chapter is all about how and what are the things that we need to do to actually catch up with the rich world. And that means growing at 8, 9, 10 percent, not 6, 7, but 8, 9, 10 percent each year for the next 30 years. Um, and if we do that, if we grow at 8, 9, 10 percent a year for the next 30 years, we will in about 20 years be as rich as China is today, as today, <laughs> right? Not in 20 years because China won't obligingly stay still while we catch up. But, you know, we'll be as rich as China is today in 20 years if we grow at that same rate for about 30 years, um, we'll start getting up into South Korean territory, but um, still be some distance away. Uh, so we're, we've got a long way to go, and it's going to involve uh, rapid growth uh, for decades. And technical capability is going to be at the heart of that story, but it's what we have to have as our goal and objective as a country. Well, let's hold a good thought. Hmm. Uh, pushing you a little bit on technical hmm. capability, uh, Noshad, the, when, when you, you paint a picture of an economic growth driven by investment in manufacturing and R&D leading to greater uh, quality of uh, uh, um, jobs. And when, um, when our uh, mutual friend Dr. Agram Rajan was here uh, a few months ago at this uh, at, at the same CIC, he, he painted a, 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 a picture of economic growth that was not uh, oh, services led. Services led mm -hmm. education and healthcare in particular, and not so much uh, let the Chinese make the Ganesha idols is what he said. Let's focus on education and healthcare. Um, so is that? Uh, do you see that as a contrasting view, or do you see that as just a different I, paint on the same sort of approach? So I think it's an uh, no. I don't think it's a. It's the same. It's it's the same product and different paint. <laughs> um, I I think I to me it's an and question, not an or question. I think for India, uh, we need the number one way in which countries catch up in their early years is through changes in employment. That the archetype is people moving from employment in relatively low value added agriculture into relatively high value added manufacturing, particularly manufacturing. In our case, um, that's the, 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 the shift has happened. But it's taken the form of people moving from relatively low value added agriculture to relatively high value added services and to a great extent informal services. So to give you a, an indication of how powerful this is, uh, think of the reverse. Uh, as you know, during the pandemic, um, we saw a lot of reverse migration of people. 
um, much of it fortunately temporary, but about 10 million people migrated permanently uh, from urban to rural India and we have seen an increase in agricultural employment of about 10 million um, in these last two years. Um, this we should see by the way in my opinion as a great failure because uh, we are not a country that needs more people working in agriculture. We have if anything too many, we need to free up many people from agriculture and move them into more productive occupations. The, my back of the envelope calculation says that the 10 million people moving from urban employment, even in informal service sector jobs, fairly poor quality jobs, to agriculture uh, cost us about 1% of GDP, right? Um, and you can work out the numbers if you take about 10,000 rupees a person, multiply it by 10 million, do the math, it comes to about a percent of GDP. That's a very big number, right? And if you have the exact reverse taking place, you will add 1% to GDP. So if we can move 10 million people every year from rural India into urban India in whatever jobs, right, we will add a percent of GDP. Second, in the economic survey a few years ago, um, there was a striking fact. It said that if, if all of Indian employment had the same productivity as we have in our modern manufacturing sector, so we have about 400 million people employed in the country, depending on whose data you use, but 400 million people employed in the country, if all 400 million were as productive as the 30 million people that we have in manufacturing, right? Um, the number was that we would have a per capita GDP that matched South Korea's. So in other words, we would have a per capita GDP of $35,000 a year instead of $2,000 a year. So that's the kind of impact that moving people from relatively low value added occupations to high value added occupations has. Now, how do you do it by the million? And this is where I uh, have a dis different view from Raghuram Rajan's. Um, is there a role for services? Without question, there is. But I'm not sure it's enough. Because as far as I've been able to see, if you look at every other country in the world, no other country in the world has been able to move millions of people, as we need to, from low value added agriculture into an activity that is much higher value added and which are good quality jobs where you can keep growing value added over time. And that tends to be only manufacturing related. So in many ways, it's a sectoral question for us. How do we get labor intensive industry to really develop rapidly in the country? So how do we get the garment industry to really grow dra dramatically, the footwear industry to grow dramatically, the food processing industry to grow dramatically. These are the labor intensive sectors. And then there's a services sector too, where I agree with Raghu, tourism. We have huge untapped potential in tourism and huge untapped employment potential in tourism in every state in the country. We're sort of scratching the surface. Um, we attract, as you, as you would know, we attract you know, something like 12 to 15 million tourists a year, uh, out of which about a half are actually NRIs coming home uh, to visit family. Um, relative to that, you know, 25 million in, go to Thailand every year, you know, 80 million go to France every year. Um, I mean, we have, what do we, you know, we have, what do we have to offer in terms of actual tourism potential more than any other country, but we're country number, what is it, 25 or something like that in the world tourism rankings. So these are the opportunities. So there is big opportunity in services, particularly in tourism, by the way. I think Raghu has been talking largely about the export of certain services, but tourism to me is a great potential um, sort of, what's it, what's it, mode you know, you have mode one, two, three, four of services exports. It's one of those four. <laughs> mode, I think, so, I think tourism is mode one or something. Mode one, right? Mode one uh, of services exports. So, and it's, there's great potential there. And it's something that we should tap. 
but I think we should also worry about labor-intensive manufacturing because where else do you put millions of low-skilled people to work? Um, you know, you can't put them all, they, they're not skilled enough to do IT jobs. They can come and do jobs as delivery, delivery boys and so on. We don't need, we don't need 50 million delivery boys. I mean, we, you know, we, we could employ 50 million people in labor-intensive manufacturing. So sticking with uh, labor-intensive mm -hmm. manufacturing, Nosha, the, mm -hmm. uh, the other side of the technical capability mm -hmm. coin is labor reform, right? And you've talked about that in your book. Yeah. And I just want to quote a statement that you make in the book, which is that labor reform is for the sake of labor. It's not for the sake of business. Yeah. Do you care to substantiate? Because that's not an argument that uh, many unions buy. Well, you know, look at it this way. Um, if, you're, if you're one of the, um, you know, 10 million people uh, working as, as a formal manufacturing person in unionized larger industry, right? Um, you don't want labor reform. But you're an incumbent. You're benefiting from that incumbency, right? And you're not thinking about the informally employed. So we have 15%, less than 15% of our 400 million people are actually covered by any labor regulations, um, any of these formal labor regulations. We should make labor regulations for 100% for the majority of the workforce and not for that small minority of 15%. And our labor laws were entirely focused on that 15% and not concerned with the 85%. So these, these reforms that have taken place where uh, 40 some laws have been consolidated into four. Um, it's a very good step. We should see it as a step, as a very good step, but it's a very good step in the process. We need to go further and further and further um, to keep making it attractive to hire people. If you ask the average industrialist, you know, um, how do you want to expand? Um, they generally want to expand without employing thousands more people. There is, because of the labor laws of the last 50 years, um, we've, we've in industry developed a mindset that says more labor is bad. Um, and it's going to take a long time. It's going to take many years before that mindset starts to change. So I have a, I have a modest proposal. My modest proposal is that um, um, we should do two things. We should try to attract some really large labor intensive companies to set up operations uh, in the country. So we should get Lee and Fung, which is the world's largest garment maker, say, listen, what will it take for you to set up a really large operation here? We need to do that. We haven't really done that. And we need to tell Fo ask Foxconn the, the same question. We have done that. And we're starting to see some traction now. Um, and I'm told that Tata's are setting up a, a, a large uh, electronic assembly plant somewhere outside Chennai, actually, um, that will employ over time 100,000 people. This is great. This is the first time ever. So the first thing we should do is try and get some of these big names uh, to set up these plants. Um, and, you know, I would encourage our prime minister to ask uh, his two friends, Mr. Ambani and Mr. Modi, to set up large garment plants uh, somewhere in the country because it would be difficult for them to say no to. You mean Mr. Ambani and Mr. Adani? Mr. Ambani and Mr. Adani, yes, that's right. Although you may two not ways. be too far off. No, no, Mr. Ambani and Mr. Adani, you're right, right. <laughs> so, yeah. Interesting mm. that you mentioned mm. uh, Lee and Fung mm. and uh, you know, textiles and electronics yeah. manufacturing is actually a, also mm. a great mm. way to address another problem that mm. you raise in your book, which is the female participation in the labor force yeah. in India is on par with Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan. What's worse, it's declining. Um, how do you think, what is your recipe for how we turn this struggle into a promise? So, yeah, so we, you know, we were, we were second to Saudi Arabia in having the uh, second worst labor, female labor force participation ratio in the G20. Now we have, now, we, now we're the worst, Saudi Arabia improved and we dropped further. So we are now the 20th out of 20 countries in female labor force participation at about 20%, right? Um, which is 
terrible. It's down from about 30 some percent if you go back uh, 20 years. Um, what do we do about it? I think it has again to do with which sectors we see growing. So, and why do I say that? Well, look at our neighbors, look at Bangladesh. Um, Bangladesh has a labor force, female labor force participation ratio that is almost twice India's. Um, now this is Bangladesh, remember, a Muslim country, yeah? Supposedly, supposedly um, more discriminatory towards women, but Bangladesh, look at the data. More than a labor, female labor force participation ratio that's almost twice India's, right? Where does it come from? Um, the garment industry. It has a booming garment industry. The garment industry employs 4 million people. 80% of the 4 million are women. Yeah? So it brings one back to, I think, the same point again, which is that labor-intensive manufacturing when correctly done, has the potential to address many issues. And one of the issues will be female labor force participation. Sure. Shifting gears yeah. a little bit mm -hmm. to free markets, mm -hmm. uh, one of the best uh, and most compelling arguments I've read on free markets is your chapter on, on free markets. Um, but ironically, we're sort of seeing the world going the other way. And What are your reflections on that? And what does it take to uh, get our uh, <laughs> prime ministers and presidents to see the argument? You know, I think to, to the credit of our current government, I think they appreciate the benefit of free markets um, with one qualification, which I'll come to in a minute. But there is this trend, there is this thing where, you know, as the world tr sort of tries to protect industry, tries to intervene in various ways, um, there is this thing that, hey, listen, you've been telling us America, UK particularly, you've been telling us to open up, etc., and you're, not, you're now moving in the opposite direction. Yes, but it's in, we, should, we should open up because it's in our interest, not because it's in the interest of uh, the UK or the US for India to open up. It's in India's interest to open up. So it's in India's interest to, uh, to, to, to be much more market-oriented in our approaches. Um, I mentioned that one qualification. Now, I think our current government does get this in terms of markets and the, 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 the rhetoric is right, right? Um, but unfortunately, there is an instinct um, in both our private sector industry, um, speaking from some, you know, as someone who spends a lot of time in CIA, um, and in the government, that if there's something that's wrong, uh, we go to the government to fix it, um, and we shouldn't. Uh, you know, so if a firm, you know, if, if, if demand isn't there, we, industry runs to the government and says, do something about demand. It's not government's job to create demand. Um, you know, it's government's job to run a responsible budget, uh, to take care of uh, criminal justice, to take care of law and order and the police, to worry about uh, primary education and public health, uh, to worry about financial regulation. It's not government's job to create demand. And when we go to, uh, when we go to the government and ask for protection, when to ask for incentives, ask for, um, ask for ways of, you know, stimulate demand by cutting this tax or that tax, I think we're doing the wrong thing. Um, that's not what we should see, uh, that's not how we should see government, uh, and government should not listen. If we do go to them and ask for that, they should not listen to us. They should uh, hear us, uh, say thank you very much, and then act in the national interest. Well, it's a bit of a chicken egg, yeah. isn't it? Because yeah. one of the things you bemoan in your book mm -hmm. is uh, the lack of competitiveness of Indian firms globally. Yeah. Uh, again, how do you think, uh, do we start with the chicken or the egg and what can Indian firms do to become go globally competitive without the safeguards that uh, the government... Uh, so, you know, so, so firms will never be ready uh, for protection to be removed. You just have to remove it before they're ready. Um, that'd be my, that would be my view. It wouldn't be a very popular move. No, it's not a popular move. But it's, uh, you know, it's, if you look at 1990, what happened in 1991? right? Uh, we were talking earlier on. There was, there was 
a lot of resistance from firms. The Bombay Club was a famous sort of semi-institution that kind of uh, was very articulate in talking about, you know, Indian industry will be destroyed. Indian industry didn't get destroyed. It thrived as the economy was opened up. Um, so Indian industry was actually stronger and better than it thought itself. And I'm convinced that it still is. Interesting. Yeah. Um, why don't we take some, on the topic of e economy and uh, trade and regulation, we'll have a separate discussion on government and politics. But on these topics, if there are any questions, uh, yeah. can we take a few from the audience? So in early, in early years, uh, the technology was almost entirely learnt from the outside. Um, and the single biggest source, when people looked at sources of technology in the early years, not, not later, and I'll come to that in a sec, but uh, in the early years, for the early industries, which were these labor-intensive industries, so they were, uh, it was textiles and garments, uh, it was actually electronic assembly a little bit later on. Um, those industries really thrive. The single source of technology that was most important to them was feedback from foreign buyers, right? a very specific source. Uh, so it was by actually exporting to demanding buyers overseas. And those demanding buyers provided a lot of feedback that drove a great deal of learning within the firms. Um, by the way, in India, the best example of that is the IT services business because that's that was I think the exact same source of technology and technical capability for many many years for the IT services industry. It was feedback from demanding buyers uh, that constantly drove firms to move up the value chain, to add new skill sets, to add new capabilities in uh, in the teams that were working. So that was the single big source, right? As as South Korea and then much later China sort of started to catch up with the frontier in many industries, they started to invest more in in-house R&D. In the early years, in the 60s and 70s, R&D didn't really matter to South Korea. Um, in the 80s, it started to matter. In the 90s, matter even more. In the 2000s, much more and so on. And today, South Korea invests more in R&D than any other country in the world as a percentage of GDP. South Korea and Israel are the two largest investors at just under 5% of GDP uh, in R&D. Um, they are the two largest, the higher than Japan, higher than the US, higher than China by a long way in, in, as a percentage of GDP. Right? In China, um, in, through to 2000, uh, R&D didn't matter. From the 2000s onwards, you start seeing increasing investment in R&D by firms. And you see today, China invests about 2.5% of GDP in R&D. Right? Um, compare us. Uh, in 1980, our investment in R&D was quite similar to South Korea's. Um, today, we invested about 0.7.8% of GDP in R&D. Today, we still invest about 0.7.8% of GDP in R&D, 40 years later. In 2000, for China, same thing. We were still at 0.7.8%. We've been between 0.6 and 0.8% for the last 40 years. Uh, China in 2000 uh, was at the same percentage as we were. Uh, today, China is three times uh, where we are. Uh, we're at 0.7, they're at 2.5, 2.4. So you start seeing these countries as they move up the value chain and build a more and more competitive industry. You start seeing them start to invest more and more in R&D, um, first in their own firms, which is something that's missing, not entirely, there are exceptions, but it's missing at the aggregate level in our country. So in India, we invest 0.3% of GDP in in-house R&D. The world average is 1.5%. China invests 2%. Uh, so it's like we have to scale by a factor of five. Of, and this has not got anything to do with the government. This is Indian industry needs to invest five times more in in-house R&D than we do now. Right? And we have a huge advantage because we, have, we produce a million engineers a year. 
Um, and these engineers are available at relatively low cost. And if the IT services business can build such a successful technology-based business on the back of this huge flow of talent, so can we, throughout manufacturing, do the same with investments in in-house R&D. There's a second part to that picture, which is the role of government in research. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about... Uh, go ahead. I'm okay, one, one, two couple sentences on that, which is the, the world invests... It's the, when the, the, the role of the government in doing research worldwide um, is significant. Um, it's small relative to the role of industry, not in India, but in, in the rest of the world, right? So if the world invests about 1.5% of GDP in in-house R&D, it invests about 0.5-0.6% of GDP from the state in public R&D. But where is that public R&D done? If it's scientific research, it's done within the higher education system. If it's technological research, for example, defense research and so on, it's done within firms. Yeah? Where do we do it? We also invest, by the way, about 0.5% of GDP in public R&D, government R&D. But we do it all in, by and large, not all, but most of it, over 80%. 80% of it in public autonomous R&D institutions, both scientific institutions and technological institutions. So we should keep funding that R&D from the public sector, but it should be done in the higher education system if it's scientific research, and it should be done in firms if it's technological research. So that's sort of the, the, the in a sense, the picture, and that supports, that work then supports it supports firms moving up the chain and doing more R&D because, because of the research being done, scientific research being done in the higher education system, um, you end up with better talent coming out from the education system, which is then available to firms for our own R&D work. Because of the research, of the, of the technological research being done in firms, it helps firms invest in new technologies that, uh, that maybe are longer longer term and need bigger tickets uh, that, in, that, that provides an incentive for firms to do more R&D. So, yeah. I, I so I that was a, a very long answer to a question. I'll try to be better. At, mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll come back to you. There's one behind you and then we'll come back, Mohan. I had a question, Mr. Forbes. You talk in the same breath about research, development, technology, and labor-intensive industry, right? In this time and age when economists are already crystal gazing about a world without work and the pace at which technology is changing, how relevant going forward is this quote-unquote labor-intensive industry? It may have been appropriate in 70s, 80s, but are we trying to compare completely different time frames and, you know, evolve a paradigm? So, you know, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, I would argue that as of today, labor-intensive industry still has a significant role to play. Will it have a role to play in 20 years? I don't know, right? But 20 years is a nice long time for us to benefit from a lot of labor-intensive industry and moving lots of millions of people into labor-intensive industry. Um, if you look around the world today, what do you see? You see in country after country, it's not in, not in India, we're fortunate there, but in country after country, you see a labor shortage. Um, you look at what's happening in the U.S. and the U.K. as they have bounced back after the pandemic. I mean, you know, present troubles uh, are changing things a bit. But until three months ago, um, both the U.S. and the U.K. are suffering from huge inflation. And that inflation is being driven largely by labor cost, by the unavailability of labor for all manner of jobs. Okay, some countries have done really idiotic things like Brexit, uh, you know, which then means that when all the people who went home during the pandemic, they can't come back without a labor permit uh, because they now need a permit where earlier they could just move and they get the permits, but it takes them so much time that by the time the restaurant gets a permit to bring in people, you know, six months has gone by, one year has gone by, and the restaurant is struggling because it has no waiters. I mean, you know, this is a story repeated thousands of times over across the UK. And... In the U.S. as well, you see the same thing, 
you walk around the street in the US these days and you will see lots of help wanted signs. Uh, restaurants, definitely, but hotels that are operating and very low service levels because they can't recruit people. Um, and even some other industries. I mean, you know, okay, Amazon has recruited and added whatever, two, three hundred thousand people, I think, during the pandemic. Um, but they struggle to fill their, their, their positions. So they, so, you know, this um, economists do write about this world without work. I think they're wrong. <laughs> At least, at least the data, the data to date says they're wrong. This question actually, It'll be a different work, but. This question reminded me of, uh, was it Ashok Desai who said, uh, India lives in many centuries at once? Um, Manmohan Singh. Manmohan Singh. Um, yeah. So mm. I guess there's yeah. sections of the population for which, or sections yeah. of the industry for which, but anyway, mm. uh, sir. More skilled occupations. The number is formidable. According to the agriculture statistics, there are 144 million agriculture laborers yep. without a square inch of land. 124 million small farmers. Now, I, I'm working in the field. I'm meeting many of them. Days together, we have struggled with them to get them trained. LNT asked us to provide carpenters, masons, electricians, and they've been willing to train them. But they are not willing to leave the village. Yeah. They want their jobs in the village itself. It's a very formidable issue. And day in and day out, we are seeing it. In Telangana, I've seen it very recently, even to Hyderabad. In Tamil Nadu, I'm seeing it. In Varanasi, we have got some projects. I'm chairman of a foundation here. But they are not willing to come out of the village. In spite of the fact some of them are educated, still they do not want to come. That's a big issue which we are facing. And as far as the women's participation is concerned, you're right, it's about 18% now. It was 32% mm. some years ago, now it has come down to 18%. One of the reasons they say is because the girls are now going to schools and colleges and earlier they were also working and they were taken into account for calculating the labor participation rate. So the government of India brought out this uh, self-help group schemes. And with that I believe almost uh, 50 million people are, women are employed, some or other. Whether they have taken into account in the labor participation rate, I do not know. But the point that you have made regarding using these people for purpose of developing tourist spots, that may have some impact because the way, but that requires some amount of education, some amount of knowledge, yeah. knowledge of history. So this is a, and I mean, I've been in finance minister for several years. I was earlier in the DEA, Department of Economic Affairs, when Mrs. Gandhi was there. Then I was Revenue Secretary, then I was in Commerce Ministry. I don't think uh, any chief economic advisor has paid attention to this problem of rural labor. Yeah. I haven't come across any economic survey dealing with this problem. They might have touched upon it, but they have not dealt with it spirit. So I had suggested in one of my lectures very recently that there should be a special mission. How do you transfer labor from the agriculture sector to more paying occupation within the district itself? There can be a district planning for this problem. But the government of India should take it upon itself. There are many missions they have got. One of these missions probably may be more productive when you transfer labor. It can easily be done and without much of an expenditure. I, I think people like you are in constant touch with the ministers and all. You should give this idea that they should work on it separately as a, in a mission mode to get agriculture labor trained and try to employ as many of them as possible within the district itself. You know, Yogi Adityanath has done a good job. One product for every district is trying to uh, promote the product with which the district is capable of producing. So that way, a lot of people can get it. So I, I, I thank you. I, I fully, I fully agree that education and training is the number one way in which one can actually include people uh, in the modern economy. And I think we should start. You know, there's a, there's a, you know, Karthik Murlidharan um, uh, has this approach that's found its way into the new education policy, which is focus on second standard outcomes, right? That every, every second standard child should be able to read and do arithmetic at the second standard level. And, you know, as you know, the data says uh, that over a third of children in fifth grade, in the fifth standard, cannot do 
cannot read and do arithmetic at the second standard level, right? So over a third, right? It varies by state. Tamil Nadu is one of the better states, but I think even Tamil Nadu, it's about a fifth, about 20% of fifth standard students cannot do reading and arithmetic at the second standard level. So we've got a big education challenge. And if you, if they event, if it, if they take most of their school to learn how to do reading and arithmetic at the second standard level, then they don't learn anything else because they, 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 they don't have that basic, that basic ability to learn what's taught in the fifth standard and the seventh standard and the ninth standard. So it's a very, very wise approach. And I think Indian industry has to engage with that, by the way, through our CSR work. So the proposal in the book is that if you just take CI members, CI members work with around rough calculation about 30,000 schools in the country. Many of those schools are in the, some of the poorer districts in the country. And if you just take those 30,000 schools, that's about one and a half million children a year that we could improve education outcomes for. And we should set ourselves the goal that all the schools that we work with, we will work on these remedial learning programs for second standard children um, so that they can read and do arithmetic at the second standard level. It's a very precise, simple, focused objective. And I think it would, in a single stroke, do more for inclusion in the long run than almost any other measure that one could that one could take. So I, so I mean that would be my uh, that would be my my proposal is a very sort of simple proposal um, for for education. Um, on the on the movement of people from agriculture into industry, I, I agree a hundred percent. You know and. Finding ways of doing that, I think the, I think we'll come, we'll end up coming back to labor-intensive manufacturing because that's the kind of job that unskilled people can do. So what I yeah. Oh yeah, to get people to move. Well, but you know. Okay. So. So for. For, so, so the big, the single biggest source of employment creation uh, in the last uh, thirty years has been the construction industry. That's the names that you mentioned. <laughs> so, the construction industry. If you take the construction industry, um, I think there's something that we have to do that goes further, and this is sort of learning from the pandemic, right? As you know, employment in the construction industry takes the form of cascading contracts. So an LNT doesn't employ labor, and LNT, by, at least not by the thousand. An LNT employs various contractors. They break up the job for building a bridge or whatever into a whole lot of pieces. They award those pieces to different contractors. Those contractors in turn employ other contractors to do various jobs for them, who perhaps then employ labor contractors who actually hire the labor. So you have a three or four tier system of labor contracts, uh, you know, which finally works its way up to the prime contractor, an LNT or a Hindustan construction. Yeah. So I think we need to do something better in terms of labor conditions, actually, and do it on a voluntary basis. We're trying to do something through CI in the Western region from the pandemic, where what we did was we tried to get firms to come together. Now we're trying to get a big construction firm to join. That's the challenge because that's who would re that's where it would really have impact. You're saying, you know, provide some basic minimum protection to the individual. So provide healthcare benefits. Um, so health insurance for the the person and their family, immediate family. Second, uh, provide some decent housing like a dormitory, etc. Because many of these construction contracts, LNT for its people will provide housing. But these are not LNT employed people. These are the contractor who's working for a contractor who's working for a contractor who's working for LNT. So they are usually, you, you, and you, know, you know where they stay. They build their own hutments and they stay somewhere near the construction site. right? And so can we provide some basic minimum housing? 
And third, can we provide some kind of unemployment insurance, not for a long period of time, but maybe for three months. So that if for any reason the person loses their job, they're provided with unemployment insurance for three, three months. The estimate that we have is that doing all of this will could be done for about between 3,000 and 5,000 rupees per person per month. It's not small. If you want to do the health, the unemployment insurance and the housing, it adds about 2,000 rupees. Otherwise, it's about 2,000 rupees for the health insurance, 1,500 to 2,000 rupees for the health insurance alone. So it's not small, but if we did that, I don't know. I think you'd find people move. I think you'd find people move. There are two questions. One is oh. borrowing from what you mentioned about the and, and audience. Um, one relates to internal migration in the country. Yes, yes. Your work on this just mentioned this. In addition to what measures you have just indicated, are there other measures which you think government should take to ensure that internal migration in the country increases? Today it's about 10%, much less than most of the countries. So unless we are able to do that, probably you won't get the kind of dispersal of agricultural or non-agricultural wage laborers yeah. in the industry that it will not happen. So in addition to what you just outlined, are there any other measures which you think, in your from your experience, are there other measures which government should take? That's one. Second, you, have, you, have, you will obviously talk about infrastructure where there has been so much of shortfall in, uh, in uh, various uh, areas and there are various there are reasons for that. Um, investment is probably one of them but safety of investment and the legal framework of uh, how to ensure that there is equality in contracts and yeah. commercial disputes rating addressed in good time. These are some of the things which come up there. Are there any other items which you think are required to be done in infrastructure because unless that comes in, all other things that you are talking about may not materialize. So two, two things that I would say. One, we need to look at FSI regulations in our cities. Um, why? Because today when people migrate into cities, where do they stay? Uh, they tend to, you tend to see slums come up. Um, and these slums are all because it's why because people and it's people who live in slums it's not that they're unemployed they have jobs um, but they live in slums because they do not have access to decent quality housing near where they work right so we have to do two things one how do we create better quality housing for people nearer where they work that's really an FSI question because our FSI regulations are amongst the most stringent in the world. Uh, we have FSI numbers that are amongst the lowest in the world. Um, you know, one is to one is a typical FSI, maybe two is to one, maybe in a big city, four is to one, right? You take a Hong Kong, FSI of 25 is to one. Um, you take New York, I think it's 20 is to one. These are, that's the way in which you actually build dense cities where people have decent um, housing that can bring, that can house people near where they work. There's a second thing that we can do, which is entirely an infrastructure question. Fast trains. Um, you know, one of the nice, one of the best books on development is a book by a British sociologist named Ronald Dore uh, on Japan. And it's called Shinohata and it's about the development of a small village and he went and spent I don't know a couple of years living in this village in the 50s and he goes back in the 60s um, and spends more time there and in that 50 to, 50s to 60s decade um, a bullet train uh, starts from Tokyo that goes past the village and near the village and life is suddenly transformed for that village. Hitachi establishes a factory in the village and people are able to move around uh, and all of a sudden the village goes from being this somewhat remote rural village to being a suburb of Tokyo um, and 
the economy transforms. And it's suddenly, so the village becomes urban, <laughs> um, almost at a stroke. And the occupations of all the people in that village suddenly change. And it's this wonderful book that talks about all these social changes that are driven by this technological change of the bullet train coming to the village. So infrastructure can be play the critical role um, in bringing people closer. I mean, you know, what is Korea's greatest challenge? Korea's greatest challenge um, is the road to Sri City. It's not anything else. It's the road to Sri City. Now, the road outside of Chennai is okay. The road to get to the road outside of Chennai is a pain in the neck, right? It takes you, it'll take you an hour to get from the center of Chennai to the outskirts of Chennai before you get on the road to get to Sri City. So if we improve that, right, it's suddenly more accessible to get to Sri City. So we have, we have infrastructure issues that are very direct and very directly the responsibility of government, it seems to me. Local government, state government, national government. And the same way, I think FSI can play a big role in enabling the development of more, of denser, more productive cities. Those would be two things. I'm sure there are other things that we would have to work on and do as well. Road formation and access to markets is hmm? a massive effect as hmm? we've seen repeatedly. Um, you mentioned the FSI and that made me think of one uh, broader it's point. Not, it's not popular, by the way. I mean, I know mm. I've, I've made this argument and um, one of my closest friends is, um, is, is, is uh, an industrialist in Bombay who is very, he's, he's known for his environmental um, uh, commitment and he thinks it's a horrible idea. Uh, but uh, so this is actually related so, to uh, my question. It's a broader yeah, question yeah. on, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, your narrative of how India can overcome its struggles and live up to its promise is premised on what is today almost an erstwhile economic model of infinite growth uh, that ignores the sort of sustainability yeah. point of view. So you, the whole book is silent on sustainability. And I just was curious what your views are on yeah. sustainable growth and development. So it's you're right. It's a big it's a big um, it's a big uh, gap in the in the book, um, and I thought about it, and I just figured that I I'm not well. Now, as of today, I'm not I'm definitely not the one to write it because uh, uh, I don't know enough uh, to write something valuable on sustainability. Um, I would say only one thing about it. Um, I do talk a lot in the book about state capacity um, and about us having fairly limited state capacity. And given our limited state capacity, I think in every area, including sustainability, we should seek those solutions that do not place a high demand on state capacity. So choice of technology is a high state capacity demand, right? But there's a low state capacity thing that one can do for sustainability, which is carbon taxes. So carbon taxes can play a big role in driving sustainability and development in a very sustainable direction in a very low state capacity way. So that's the one comment I'd make. But, uh, uh, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's a gap in the book. Sure. Yeah. Well, your comment about state capacity is actually a good segue for us to shift oh. from economy to government. Oh. Um, and I... I, I I agree with the point that you, uh, point of view that you've taken in the book, which is that uh, in the Indian context, the government should do less but do better. Uh, what it does, do it should fewer do things, fewer but do things, them better. But do them better. Yeah. But your argument is uh, premised on the fact that uh, state capacity is not adequate. <laughs> uh, but aren't there better arguments? And if if state capacity being lower is the argument, shouldn't we build state capacity? No, you're you're uh, you're right. So. Karthik Buridharan is currently writing a book. Who, by the way, just landed here yesterday. <laughs> Did he? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, good. So, so Karthik is writing a book on, on governance and largely governance in the Indian states. And it's all about how do you build state capacity. It's very persuasive and he has lots of things that need to be done. Hmm? Um, and it's a different... He's coming at the same problem but from a different end. He's coming at... What do you need to build in the state to build this capacity over time? I'm sort of saying, hey, listen, we have to do a lot of things as a country here and now. And given that we have to do a lot of things here and now, 
we have to work with the state that we have, with the capacity that it has. So let's design our policies so that they'll work here and now with the limited state capacity that we have. So I'm making a somewhat short term argument. If we build state capacity in the long run, wonderful. Um, I'm happy to revise my view. But first, let's build the state capacity. Until then, let's design policy on the assumption of low state capacity. That's my, that's my perspective. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say this about state capacity in a room with so many senior retired civil servants. Wait, wait till you hear my next question. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> so. Human capacity. Yeah. The way in which the officers and others function, mm -hmm. the extent to which they are trained to function. Second is the technological capacity of the state, how well they are modernized in dealing with things. And third is the legal capacity, how many laws they make, which suits everybody and which promotes progress. Now, when you look at the number of people employed in India, in very the public, small. public sector, very small. it is one of the lowest in the world. Yeah. And what are we talking about state capacity? We don't have many judges. We don't have policemen. Everywhere there are vacancies. That's why Modi gave the call that before the end of this year, we will have one million people added to our uh, employment to this. Because everywhere, I mean, I've been in finance for umpteen years. The first thing they do is don't fill up the vacancies. Because if you don't fill up the vacancies, then there's no recurring expenditure. So this is a very, very I mean, serious problem yeah. as far as the government is concerned. So state capacity, when you talk of uh, the state capacity in India, you look at it. From, and every time the government recruits more people, you have the media screaming. Babus, babus, number of babus are increasing, number of babus. Total number of IAS officers in the country today is 5,500 for the whole country. The total number of SES officers, senior executive service officers in the federal government of the United States is 8,000. Only the federal government. So look at the ratio. Look at the ratio of number of so, officers. So, 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 I, so I absolutely agree with you. We have a very small state. But whatever the reason, right, the end result is that we have low state capacity. Um, and well, one qualification to, to what you said also. As you know, uh, one of the comments that people have made about employment within the Indian government is that if you look at spending, the spending is concentrated union governments, state governments, and very limited spending at the local government level. Uh, China, which is supposed to be this highly centralized country, actually the, over half the total budget is spent by local governments. Right? Um, I believe the number for India is under 10% is spent by local governments. Local, 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 right? Yeah. So, you know, so you have a huge gap uh, in where the actual spending is taking place. Uh, a large part of the spending is at the state level uh, in our country, but at the state level, not at the local level. And I think finding ways in which we start addressing these issues, but until we address all these issues, I'm saying design policy on the basis of the assumption of low state capacity. <laughs> so I'm not saying we shouldn't address these issues, but first address the issues. Reactions or yeah. questions from this side of the room, it's been fairly quiet. That's right, that's right, that's right. We must, we must move. I had a question for yeah. a long time. I love your point on how the state, or at least the country should focus on tourism. But I think it comes with a rider and maybe as you think through the sustainability part in future books, which I would love to hear you from, is uh, it's very easy to talk about tourism and you know how we should and I think it might be a great idea to get people in local areas stay in the local areas. My experience in Tunnel Valley has been very different. We have not got people who want to stay there. There are more people who want to come to the city for a job. It's been very different. Um, but I think it comes with a big rider when it actually gets into the implementation at a panchayat or tasildar level. Because when we talk about tourism, it also has to be aesthetically appealing. Oh. And I don't think uh, there is a lot of that that presence in the government or that, that uh, I don't know, that DNA in the government. So while we talk about sustainability and while the government, I, I have got to say that every time I read in the paper of the government is going to develop an area for tourism, <laughs> I think it's certainly not going to be sustainable. 
So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So, I mean, I think it comes back to the question that was asked earlier also. You know, what is the role of, what can the government do? If it, if it sets out to promote tourism, what can it do? And I think our expectations should, should again be focused and limited, right? And again, I mean, this is an, I have to say that, you know, I, have, I think I, I would argue that I have some expertise in R&D policy and innovation policy and tourism policy. I, I mean, I'm a complete novice, so I apologize for that. But I think it's a very important potential area for us. My sense is that the really the what the role of the government would be in infrastructure and in regulations that come in the way of tourism infrastructure developing so what would tourism infrastructure involve transport so take for example the state of madhya pradesh madhya pradesh i think is a state with tremendous tourism potential right i think there's a huge infrastructure deficit in madhya pradesh because if you want to travel from the south of madhya pradesh to the north of madhya pradesh if you want to travel by air you fly via delhi it doesn't make sense to me i mean why can't you fly within madhya pradesh you know from the south to the north so there are many such examples right where we need to if we are serious about tourism then we need to ensure good connectivity um, good road infrastructure which is improving significantly Right? But that also includes then getting into and out of cities. Right? Um, it involves then probably regulations on who can start hotels and where and how and where can they be run. You know, and maybe we need some, a set of a sort of hierarchy of regulations so that cheaper and smaller hotels do not have to comply with all the regulations that someone setting up a uh, you know, a Taj or a Hyatt have to comply with. Uh, I mean, maybe there are ways in which we can think of how um, how the various pieces that make tourism happen and make tourism attractive. Uh, and then I think we should worry. We should worry about uh, we should worry about security issues. Uh, certainly, in some parts of the country, in terms of them being attractive tourism. Um, destinations but i mean we have everything else we have all the stuff that others others try to manufacture and create i mean you know, singapore some years ago decided they needed a nightlife so they created a nightlife area i mean the government did you know they uh, they 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 redid this whole area along these two rivers and created a nightlife area and said this is the and it worked right that's not the way we should go about doing things we should at least we should enable people to set up those that nightlife area <laughs> Sorry. New York Zoo yeah. has got a Kana Kisri, which is a very famous game sanctuary in Madhya Pradesh. Good, but then you should be able to reach it. New York is in there. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Um, so this is a discussion about per capita. Whatever you do in India, if you reduce it to per capita, so we are in a serious situation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the denominator is not in your control at all. It's about 135 crore. You have to divide it by one. He's trying to give you the mic, huh? <laughs> I can hear you, but I don't know. Maybe the. Okay. So, I mean, what do we do about it? Focus only on the numerator and whatever metrics that you want to focus and ignore the denominator because it, you can only control the rate of growth of population. You can't reduce it. So this is the problem that we are facing. Is there a solution to this? No, I, I think you have to do both. You know, you have to you have to look at the absolute, and you have to also look at the per capita, because at the end of the day, that says how how wealthy is the average Indian, right? I mean, we have to look at per capita, um, because um, yeah. We have to look at per capita. So I mean, I don't think we can get away from that. I think we have to look at per capita everything. Um, now, is it a fair comparison? No, it's not a fair comparison for certain things. So for example, if you're talking about vaccinations, right? Um, you could say, look, you know, we as a country had to do more per day than Singapore had to do in total, right? More per day, <laughs> right? Um, but Yes, but we had to do more than more per day. So per capita still is a metric that matters because at the end of the day, you know, doing better than Singapore, big deal. We haven't worked, we haven't succeeded in protecting the population. The only way we succeed in protecting the population is when 
we actually achieve what we have to do per capita. So I think we have to do per capita. So is there any metric in which we are not struggling? Is there any metric in which we are not struggling? Yeah. Oh, I mean, there are, there are obviously many metrics in which we've done very well, and I, I talk about them in the book. So, for example, in the last 30 years, India has been one of the world's 10 best performing economies um, in terms of, by the way, per capita GDP growth, right? So, if you take per capita GDP growth, we've been one of the world's 10 best performing economies for the last 30 years, right? Not for the last five, but for the last 30 years, right? Including the last five. We have to be, that, should, that has to be our minimum, right? That in the next 30 years, and almost everyone says that in the next 30 years, India will continue to be one of the world's 10 best performing economies. I'm making the argument we should be the world's best performing economy, uh, not just one of the 10 best performing. Yeah. There's a question at the back. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, is there any distinction between a, a sort of a sensitive struggle and an insensitive struggle? Do we, do we have the real struggle here? Are we sensitive towards the struggle and the promises thereof? Because you were mentioning about uh, the, uh, uh, a little bit about the stall projects in uh, the local bodies which hamper the growth i'm i'm not i'm i'm not sure i get the question what do you you mean in in the question? Huh. the question is very simple is the struggle which we mean is sensitive or insensitive sensitive means all the people come together well but you know i mean we i would argue that I sympathize with, with where you're trying to go. But I'm saying, I guess I'm saying, we should not wait for all the people to come together. We should say, how do we achieve our desired objectives um, regardless, right? So will we achieve that as, in as uh, nice a way as we could? Maybe not. But I think the needs that we have are, you know, how do you grow really rapidly? Uh, how do you create wealth that then gets spread across? How do you empower and include as many of our millions in our growth and development? How do we do it in as sustainable a way as we can? I mean, all of these are, these are, these are the big questions. Um, and sometimes in answering some of those big questions, yes, we, 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 tend to stamp on some of the details um, and then we have to go back and fix things that we've stamped on and messed up. But I think we should get on and do it and then go back and fix them. To give you an example again from Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh, you know, as you know, came in for a lot of justified criticism for its labor, uh, its labor situation, lab working conditions, right, for people in the garment industry, right, they had terrible safety. Uh, a terrible safety record, ter terrible accidents that kill many people, that hurt many more people. Um, I'm not in any way arguing for any of that, right? Um, but I am saying that, you know, some of the regulations, right, safety regulations, you don't compromise on, right? But maybe hours of work, you know, women can't work after dark, you know, all this stuff, yeah, maybe it's a nice thing to have, but maybe some of those things um, we have to live with and simply get on and put millions of people to work first. And then you look at what's happened in Bangladesh now, there is increasing focus on cleaning up their act, on improving safety in the garment industry, on improving working conditions in the garment industry, because they're being driven to do that not by the Bangladesh government, by by buyers who are under pressure from their customers that if they don't clean up their act, then they'll boycott them. And so they're cleaning up their act and improving safety in the industry. But first, they've, they've created these millions of jobs. So, so that's the, 
in the last 30 years, India has grown at the rate of about 6.2%, average rate of yep. growth, not compound rate of growth. And in the case of China, it has been 85 so people ask me this question, don't you think that this difference of 2.3% is a price we have paid for democracy and freedom? So I said yes, one could say that because if you look at uh, the mm. <coughs> Chinese way of uh, conducting their business, it's not the way we have conducted the business in India for all these years. And secondly, there is one big difference between China and India because every state has got its own different kind of outlook on development. Only now there is a competitive spirit. UP wants to become a $1 trillion economy, Chen Tamil Nadu wants to become a $1 trillion economy, Maharashtra wants. So they are competing with one another, it's a very good thing now. So as far as India is concerned, we have to look at it from the point of view of the dynamics of the situation here. And this government is of course being criticized very badly for centralizing everything and making everything uniform. But we have to look at it from a different point of view. We will never be able to achieve that rate of growth which China achieved in the last 25, 30 years. Maybe slightly improved rate of growth we can have, as you said, if we go in for more and more technology, more and more R&D. Foxconn, I was reading a book, uh, Dying for an iPhone. If you have come across that book, it's worth reading it. It was written by three authors who probably worked uh, undercover in Foxconn factories. Foxconn secured 36,000 patents across the world and it keeps on buying patents from other countries and they use it at the opportune moment. And secondly, if you read this book, Dying for an iPhone, it is really heart rending how Foxconn works. A million people they employ in China and a large number of students between the ages of 15 and 17 who are called in as apprentices, are made to work for 12 hours. For three weeks, they are not even given one day off. And their salary is half the salary paid to the other people. And this person has to work only putting a screw on the iPhone. 12 hours, he just so, puts a screw on the iPhone. I don't know how they work in India. Maybe slightly different. So our system can definitely not be able to produce that rate of growth as China has produced. How much we may, may strike. I mean, I've been in government so, for nearly th how many years? 37, 38 years. I don't, I don't agree. The reason I don't agree, uh, the reason I don't agree, uh, is is because is because if if our expectation of the Indian government is the same as the expectation that Chinese have of the Chinese government, then we will get this differential rate of growth. We should not expect the same from the Indian government, right? So the Chinese government will play that role. They decide which industries are the right industries to invest in. They decide uh, where that investment should take place. They decide how much R&D and subsidy and so on should go into different sectors. We shouldn't do any of that from the Indian government. That should be private initiative, right? Um, and the role of the state then is a different role here. And if the role of the state is different, and we recognize that that role of the state is different, I think we have the chance to match China's growth rate without wonderful state-led initiatives. No, I'm very happy yeah, this that's, sort of that would be my view. That would be my view. What huh? uh, yeah? CIC finds yeah. itself in, so yeah. I'm glad we're having this uh, yeah. discussion. Mm -hmm. We're running a little bit out of time. Yeah, but yeah. Before we wrap, I wanted to ask you if you could just talk a little bit about this chapter on culture, which. I think you've just pushed to the end, but it's probably a very interesting and, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I would have probably put it earlier in the book if I was writing it, but uh, a lot of interesting so, thoughts in there. So I got, I, got feedback from, I got feedback from two people who said, well, you should put the culture chapter and the politics chapter up front. Um, and both those chapters come in the last section of the book. They're the last two chapters, and it comes in a section of the book called Just Rambling. Right? Is that the scholar in you being a little defensive? Yes. <laughs> so, right. But it's also me being, it's also me saying that, listen, this is for, this is meant to prompt discussion. These are thoughts that I'm, these are sort of reflections and thinking that's meant to prompt discussion. I'm not saying I have the right answer. Um, and if you like, the culture chapter is a chapter that argues in favor of 
that we start with being a really diverse country. And given that we're a very diverse country, how do we turn our diversity into a strength instead of an impediment that we work with? So how do we use, for example, our soft power um, as a big advantage? The fact that we are liked around the world, that we're welcome around the world. How do we use all of that as an advantage um, instead of trying to behave like China, which we are not? <laughs> you know, so that's the yeah. Um, and uh, you know, how do we use how do we use our spirit of entrepreneurship that we have in the country, which is in such great abundance? Um, all the elements of culture, and how do we foster that collective will to develop without it being sort of centrally directed? Yeah. Um, the politics chapter is definitely in the ramblings category. And it sort of says that, well, actually for us to succeed as a country, I think, I think we have to remind ourselves of what it means to be a liberal democracy. I know liberal is an unfashionable word these days. I think it's a word we have to reclaim for ourselves. And we have to reclaim it, why? Because that's the only way in which a country of our diversity can really prosper. Um, let me, not, not something I mentioned in the book, but probably should have. Um, does anyone believe that we would be a stronger and more successful country with 200 million disaffected people? No chance, right? Um, so we have to think about social cohesion issues because that's essential to our development in the long run if we have any aspiration of world leadership and of being a leading power. Um, simply because, you know, I mean, you want, you know, you, you, you want, one wants to mistreat the Parsis, you don't, we don't matter, you know, we're, 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 round off, we're not even in the round off era, right, of the population. But if you are 200 million strong, you can't be ignored. So we have to include in growth and development. And if you're going to include growth and development, you have to have that sense of tolerance, you have to have that sense of nuance, you have to have that sense of um, details matter. You have to have that sense of, um, you know, where, where small, where, where, where listening, where humility, all of this is part of the way in which we have to govern ourselves. So that's the politics chapter then, and the culture chapter, but very, very briefly. So <laughs> maybe one last question to wrap and then, yeah. See, the exports uh, last year was around the four, three to five million dollars on an economy of for 3 trillion, which works out around 16%, yep. which means the local produce is 84% uh, and export 16. As India moves on, do you think that ratio has to change or uh, should it be the same mix is okay? So, you know, if you look at the, uh, the, the way in which economists measure openness, if you like, is they take exports plus imports divided by GDP, right? Um, and our peak was in uh, 2012, when we hit about 55% of GDP. Explos imports plus exports put together was about 55% of GDP. It's since fallen back to around 40%, right? But even at 40%, we're higher than China and we're higher than the US. So actually, the Indian economy is significantly open even today. Uh, the question that someone asked, are we, you know, are there no areas where we don't struggle? This is a good example, right? The same was not true in 1991. In 1991, right, India had a lower trade to GDP ratio than both the US and China. And things took off in the 90s and 2000s. And China first took off ahead of us, but then we took off after. Both of us crossed the US well ahead, meant a decade or more ago. And since then, um, in the mid 2010s, uh, we crossed China in terms of our trade to GDP ratio. So uh, we're doing fine, actually, on the trade to GDP side. The point is, how do you actually use trade as one as an additional engine of growth? And that probably means it'll have to actually Go, rise even further 
for a period of time because we have that potential uh, to actually grow trade even further than where we are now. No, sure. I've enjoyed this discussion just as much or more than I've enjoyed reading the book. Thank you for this and all the passion and the ideas and the insights that you've shared with us. Um, so over to you, Mr. Santamali. Thank you for that fascinating discussion. All the promises in the book, so please do read the book. <laughs> the struggle that we have been having is keeping to the time. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I'm sure. Please, please well do read the book. It's mm -hmm. I have read it, and it's uh, it's it covers a lot of. Uh, ground that uh, and read read it for the Lakshman cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. And uh, as usual, some housekeeping uh, announcements. We have a series of events coming up, which we'll keep you informed. Uh, next week there would be one on cotillionomics. Uh, this is by an American-based economist. We will send you the details uh, soon. And after that, we have one on the conservation of uh, lions. Uh, that's also an interesting topic which is coming up because the author promises to discuss about the introduction of the cheetahs from Africa. So that's a that's a topic which would be extremely uh, topical and uh, also interesting. So thank you very much, Kapil, for conducting this session so professionally. Thank you, Noshad, for coming down uh, and uh, enlightening us with, uh, I'm sure the conversation can go on, but in the interest of time, we have to call Thank you. it a Thank close you today. Much. Thank you very much, all of you, and uh, thank the audience for actively participating. We hope to see more and more of you in the coming sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you.